Welcome to my review of the Siglent SSA3000X series Spectrum Analyzer. There are two models within the series, the 2.1 GHz model and the 3.2 GHz model. I'm going to be reviewing the 3.2 GHz SSA3032X because, let's face it, all the interesting action is going to be happening around the 2.4 GHz area of the spectrum. I'm also going to be talking about some of the accessories and options you can get. All the review samples were given to me by Siglent, and I'm doing the review under the explicit terms that I can say whatever I want about the product, good or bad. Okay, when you unbox the unit, it comes with a power cable, USB cable, software CD, but no other accessories. The unit uses Type-N connectors, which is the standard for spectrum analyzers, but if you're like me and most of the things you test have SMA connectors, you're going to have to buy some adapters separately. Siglent does sell kits with the most common adapters, but I ended up buying these Type-N to SMA adapters from DigiKey because I already have most of the accessories I need. I was happy to see that the maximum DC input voltage was 50 volts, because that would easily kill my SignalHound spectrum analyzer. Normally I would use a DC block in series with the input for protection, but for this review I'm not going to use one. If you're new to working with spectrum analyzers, make sure you never apply any DC to the input, and if you don't trust yourself, use a DC block. So, first impressions. The screen is huge. The resolution is 1024 by 600, and it is bright. No problems with viewing angles or reflections from the sides and the top, but it does start to look a little strange when viewed from below. I found no significant problems with fingerprints. It's not a touch screen, but it's nice to know that it's pretty solid. You can push the screen hard enough to knock the unit over, and you won't get any of those pixel color changes like you do on a computer monitor. Basically, it's a damn good screen. Next, let's talk about build quality and user interface. On the external build quality, I did find a problem. The buttons and the chassis of the unit feel solid, but I've gotta say, the main selector knob is a little flimsy and doesn't live up to the quality of the rest of the unit. Sometimes when turning the knob slowly, it doesn't always register each detent. Sometimes it takes two detents to register as a button press. And when using the knob to scroll across the screen, there's no acceleration function, so it's very slow. The product is still perfectly usable, I just found this slightly disappointing. As for the user interface, I'm pretty happy with it. There's a back button with a deep memory depth, which is very useful for quickly navigating between menus. The buttons are grouped in a logical fashion. You can use the keypad for typing out things like frequencies and file names. It's obviously not as good as a touchscreen, but it's definitely more usable than a lot of equipment I've used. It's kind of like texting on an old phone. I like the fact that the main controls that you would use the most often are grouped together with large buttons right next to the screen. I also think it's kind of funny how they called this button Auto-Tune. I'm sad to report that this Spectrum Analyzer did not fix my terrible singing. In all seriousness, basically it just figures out the highest peak in your spectrum and zooms in on it automatically. Just like an oscilloscope's auto button, it is not a substitute for knowing how to use your equipment. And personally, I think it would be better to put the more useful bandwidth button in its location. There's a help button which works as you'd expect. For example, at one point I was wondering if there was some sort of black magic that allows you to switch between a 50 and 75 ohm input, but a quick push of the help button gave me the answer. The preset button is a nice feature that instantly gets you back to a full 3.2 GHz span, or you can set it up to use whatever settings you want. I like how there's this little progress bar at the bottom of the screen to show you how much each sweep has been updated. There's also a little section where it tells you how long each sweep is going to take. For example, a full 3.2 GHz sweep at 3 kHz bandwidth will take about 4 minutes, which is really fast. At 1 MHz you can get a full 3.2 GHz sweep roughly twice per second, which is going to be fantastic for taking a high-level look at EMI problems before zooming into specific problem areas of the spectrum. And I love the fact that the progress bar disappears when you're sweeping faster than once per second, because that would just be annoying. There's the option to switch the x-axis from a linear scale to a log scale, which is kinda cool, but it doesn't seem like it's sampling at log intervals, it's just plotting the sweep differently. 
Speaking of the x-axis, I really feel like it should be displaying the start and stop frequencies below the chart at all times because there's more than enough space to do it. Sometimes you have to go to the frequency controls in order to see that information. If we go to the peak menu, I really like how the peak search navigation works. And I really like this peak to center frequency shortcut. It's a huge time saver. Now check this out. You can manually change the threshold above the noise floor for which a peak gets registered. The peak table feature works well and it lets you see up to 16 peaks at the same time. Unfortunately, there's no way to display the frequencies on top of the peaks themselves. Now let's talk about AM and FM demodulation. I'm really happy that Siglent put this feature in their spectrum analyzers because not all spectrum analyzers have them. But I did find some flaws. The minimum volume setting is still way too loud for iPhone earbuds. You'll have to use less efficient ones. In fact, I'm not sure this output is even meant for headphones because it has no trouble directly powering a 4 ohm speaker. Also, I strongly recommend you use the zero frequency span setting and set demodulation time to 5 milliseconds. Otherwise, you end up with annoying noise during the sweeps. Now let's start talking about performance. On the marketing material for the analyzer, you'll see that the average noise level is minus 161 dBm per hertz. Now this is a standard way of describing noise levels on a spectrum analyzer, but if you're new to spectrum analyzers, you might not realize that the noise floor you're going to get is not minus 161 dBm. It's going to be noisier than that, and the exact level depends on your resolution bandwidth setting and the frequency you're trying to measure. You can get more detail on this by digging into the product datasheet, but I wanted to do some of my own tests. So the test setup here is that I'm using a Type-N to SMA adapter, and I'm putting a 50 ohm terminator on it. The preamp is on, the attenuator is set to zero, and the detector is just sampling. I'm going to turn averaging mode on the traces, and we're going to look at some real world noise levels. For the beginners out there, basically the noise floor of a spectrum analyzer will limit your ability to measure weak RF signals because after a certain point, the noise might become larger than the signal you're trying to measure. Doing a full sweep at 300 kHz bandwidth, we've got about minus 112 dBm at the low end of the spectrum. There's a sudden increase in noise once we reach about 2.9 GHz, and the noise is maxing out at about minus 98 dBm. Given that you can do this full 3 GHz sweep in about one second, this is very nice to work with. Let's do another full spectrum sweep at 10 kHz bandwidth, and you can see that the noise starts out at about minus 127 dBm. It does increase as the frequency goes up, and by the time we reach 3 GHz, we've got about minus 112 dBm. You can also start seeing 2.4 GHz noise in the middle. Just so you know, I live in a very noisy area, and 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi is literally unusable in the same room as the router. Let's change the resolution bandwidth to 10 Hz now, which is the minimum setting of the analyzer. Let's zoom in on some specific frequencies, and let's compare my measurements to the claims of the datasheet. At 1 MHz, we've got minus 152 dBm, which is insanely low. 10 MHz, minus 153 dBm. 99.3 MHz, which is right on top of a powerful FM station in my area, minus 154 dBm. Basically, nothing. 433 MHz, minus 155 dBm. 915 MHz, minus 152 dBm. 2.338 GHz, right smack in the middle of all my noise, minus 149 dBm. And at the noisiest end of the spectrum, nearly minus 141 dBm. Basically the noise floor is fantastically low, and my measurements were actually better than the datasheet. Numbers like these are the kind of thing you'd only expect to see in really high-end test equipment. Other reviewers have already talked a lot about phase noise, so I'll just be quick here. I did a few tests at low frequencies, and I found the phase noise to be extremely low, on par with the claims of the datasheet. At 10 Hz bandwidth with a tight span, it's almost impossible to tell whether the noise is coming from my signal generator or the spectrum analyzer. Basically, pure tones look exactly the way you would want them to here. But be aware that this low noise close to the signal comes at a cost. At 100 kHz out with 10 kHz bandwidth, things look a lot different, but it's still in spec. Now, there's another non-ideality that I want to talk about. 
spurious readings, or spurs. There is no such thing as a perfect spectrum analyzer, and what often ends up happening during sweeps is you get measurements of signals that don't actually exist. Check out this webpage on more details for why this can happen. Spurs can pop up in ways that seem almost random, depending on your frequency, span, and bandwidth settings. It's extremely time-consuming to try all the possible combinations, but I want to document as many as I can in this review so RF beginners don't get confused by them. With a full 3.2 GHz span and 1 kHz resolution bandwidth, I found these spurs at 345.6 MHz, 930 MHz, and 1.9 GHz. We're looking at about minus 108 dBm, so not too bad. The 345 MHz spur is weird because it doesn't exist at a span of 8 MHz, it appears at a span of 4 MHz, then disappears at a span of 2 MHz, then comes back at 1 MHz. I zoomed in on the 930 MHz spur, and it turns out it's not a spur because it's sporadic. It's an RF signal coming from outside the unit. The level is about minus 105 dBm with a terminated input, which is significant enough that I thought you should see it. Maybe there's some sort of shielding issue at that frequency. The 1.9 GHz spur is interesting because it makes for a good example of how to tell whether it's a spurious reading or not. Right now we have a span of 500 kHz. Let's zoom in and reduce the resolution bandwidth and see how different it looks. You can see that it's extremely narrow, literally only a few hertz wide. Highly unlikely that's a radio transmitter. So that's clue number one. Clue number two is that if I change the setting on the input attenuator, the peak levels change accordingly. So this signal is definitely coming from inside the spectrum analyzer. On a span of 100 kHz with 1 kHz bandwidth, I found a spur at 40 MHz. And at 80 MHz, there's another spur that pops up at 10 Hz bandwidth. And with a span of 5 kHz and 10 Hz bandwidth, I found spurs at 1.54 GHz and 1.155 GHz. There are probably more spurs than this, but this is what I was able to find. As annoying as these are, they are within the specifications of the datasheet, and every spectrum analyzer has them in some form or another. Just because a review doesn't talk about spurs, it doesn't mean that they're not there. For what it's worth, I'm seeing a lot fewer spurs than I get on my SignalHound SA44B. Moving on, the amplitude accuracy is stated to be within 0.7 dB. I can only test that at lower frequencies, but my minus 10 dBm test sweep was exactly as flat and accurate as I was hoping it would be. Now let's talk about options. The 3000X series has built-in tracking generator hardware, and for $169 you can enable it as an option. The output is adjustable from 0 to minus 20 dBm, and now I want to test how flat the output is. The test setup is a 12-inch Type-N RG142 cable going from the tracking generator to an SMA to N adapter on the RF input. Now, for the first 2.8 GHz, the output is pretty flat at about plus or minus 1 dB. But above that, it starts looking a bit strange. I'm not concerned about the 4 dB dip because it's probably due to the cable and adapter and it would easily normalize out. Zooming in, you can see that starting at about 2.83 GHz, you get these sharp 1 and 2 dB changes in amplitude. This was done to keep the output within its 3 dB specification, and I think you should be aware of it in case you're measuring something where this might make a difference. It's worth mentioning that the tracking generator controls are fully automatic and adjust to whatever frequency range is on screen. This is good for beginners, but more advanced users may be disappointed that there's no convenient way to use the tracking generator as a test signal generator and do spectrum sweeps at the same time. Now I'm going to do a quick test to check how the tracking generator handles a real-world situation. I've got this RF amplifier board, and I want to see how much it amplifies signals of different frequencies. I've got two Type-N to SMA cables connected to the tracking generator and the RF input. In series with them, I have a female-to-female -female SMA adapter and a DC block. The DC block isn't necessary here, but since I'm measuring an active component, I want to set a good example for beginners. I've got the preamp off and the attenuator set to 30 dB because I'm expecting significant amplification. Now, because tracking generators never generate perfectly flat sweeps, and we have a bunch of cable and connector losses, we end up with this slightly wonky line on screen. So the first thing we do is we hit Normalize, and the Spectrum Analyzer calibrates for all the amplitude variations in our test setup, 
giving us a perfectly flat trace up top at 0 dB. Now I'm going to remove the SMA to SMA adapter and put the RF amp in series with the cables. I'm going to power up the amplifier and you can see the trace jumps up above the reference level. So I just adjust the reference level and now you can see how the amplifier has reasonably flat gain across a full 3 GHz span, which is exactly what I'd expect given that this thing is meant to amplify 6 GHz and beyond. And in a similar way I'm going to characterize this passive 10 dB attenuator. Minus 10 dB, not bad. In general I found the tracking generator extremely easy to use. It's not perfect, but for $169, if you don't already have a tracking generator, you'd be an idiot to not get this. Moving on, for $465 you can get the Advanced Measurement Kit Upgrade, which lets you measure all these different things. But curiously missing is Total Harmonic Distortion. Anyway, I ran it through some examples. You can measure channel power and set the bandwidth it does integration across. It can automatically figure out occupied bandwidth or you could measure the adjacent channel power ratio. And everyone's favorite, you can generate spectrograms, which are extremely useful for observing any kind of periodic signal and hunting down noisy RF sources. For my next test, I connected the unit to my laptop via a USB cable and installed Siglent's Easy Spectrum software. Basically, it allows you to control everything on the spectrum analyzer remotely. And in addition to the 2D waterfall plot, you can also view it in 3D. And here's some footage of me playing around with the software for doing automated EMI measurements. Basically, you choose the limits, define the parameters of a quick pre-scan, then you do a pre-scan to discover roughly where all the troublesome peaks are. Then in the final scan, it automatically configures the spectrum analyzer to do a more detailed scan of each peak. The EMI measurement upgrade also allows you to select resolution bandwidths of 200Hz, 9kHz, and 120kHz, and you can change the dwell time on the quasi-peak detector. I spent some time playing around with editing limits on the spectrum analyzer, and this was the only time I ever felt that menu navigation was a little awkward but I'm not sure how they could have done things differently. I think if you want to do detailed FCC compliance testing, you're better off using the desktop software to control the spectrum analyzer remotely. The software seems to be based on National Instruments Virtual Instruments software architecture, and although it's pretty basic, I couldn't find any stability issues. Now I want to talk about how to measure antenna performance. Most of the time when you're shopping for antennas, you'll see specifications like this. They'll tell you the bands it operates in, the gain, and the visoire, which is a measure of how good the antenna is at radiating. The problem is this doesn't tell you anything about how the antenna performs across a wide range of frequencies. If you're using it for receiving, does it reject all the frequencies you don't want? If you're using it for transmitting, does it efficiently transmit across a narrow frequency band, or would it just inefficiently radiate at any frequency? A good antenna manufacturer will supply a chart of the antenna's return loss across a wide range of frequencies, but very few manufacturers do this. Return loss and visoire are two ways to express the same thing, and let's run through an example. Basically, the lower the return loss figure, the better the antenna is at radiating at that frequency. Over here, if we fed 600 MHz into this antenna, the return loss would be minus 1 dB which means that the antenna will reflect the 600 MHz signal right back into the transmitter with only a 1 dB loss. In other words, this antenna barely radiates anything at 600 MHz. Now at 800 MHz, we've got minus 22 dB. This means that the signal reflected back into the transmitter will be 22 dB lower because the antenna is radiating almost all of the 800 MHz signal. So you can see how this antenna is clearly optimized to transmit and receive on certain frequencies. And it's pretty easy to convert between return loss and visoire if you prefer one or the other. Now if you want to be able to make charts like this, you need some extra hardware and a software upgrade. The reflection measurement software upgrade is $429, but for an extra $130 you can get Siglent's reflection bridge. Sometimes these things are called directional bridges or return loss bridges, 
but Siglent is calling it a reflection bridge. Here's how the process works. The tracking generator spits out an RF signal at a certain frequency. This gets fed to the device under test, in this case an antenna. The antenna is going to radiate some of the signal, but since no antenna is perfect, it's also going to reflect some of the signal back. The reflection bridge redirects that reflected signal and sends it to the spectrum analyzer's input. The spectrum analyzer measures the strength of that signal and then compares it to the level of the signal the tracking generator sent to the antenna. So it can compute the return loss in dB at a given frequency. And yes, I am simplifying things here. So let's run through a quick example. I've got my frequency range set from 0 to 2 GHz because that's what the bridge is rated for. We start by going to Mode, Reflection Measurement. We get this wonky line on screen that's completely meaningless because of all of the losses associated with the connectors and stuff. So we select Calibrate Open Load. This calibrates the instrument to assume that everything we have in the setup right now will give 100% reflection at all frequencies because we have no antenna connected. Now we connect the antenna. I'm going to move the reference level down by 10 dB to make things easier to see. Then we can use the various markers to measure the frequencies where the antenna is resonating the most and the analyzer will display the frequency, return loss and visoir. Now, in a real-world test, you're probably going to want to have a suitable ground plane and with the antenna far away from people and equipment, which would mean using some RF cables. So, from the spectrum analyzer side of things, everything looks great. Return loss measurements are exactly as easy as they should be. But I want to dig deeper into this reflection bridge. The marketing material states that typical directivity is 20 dB. Let me quickly explain what that means. Remember how I said that the bridge will direct the reflected signal from the antenna towards the spectrum analyzer's input? Well, it won't do it perfectly. It can never completely separate the waves that are traveling forward towards the antenna from the waves that are being reflected backwards from the antenna. Directivity is a way of quantifying how good a directional coupler is at isolating the reflected signal, which is what we want to measure. A good rule of thumb is that you want to have directivity that is at least 10 dB higher than the return loss you expect to measure, and ideally 20 dB or more. I asked Sigilant for detailed information on their directional bridge, and this is what I received. This is not an official specification for the device, it's just one set of tests they did on one sample unit. The insertion loss is not something I'm concerned with because that would be mostly compensated for in calibration anyway and the coupling is pretty flat across the whole spectrum, so no problems there. What does concern me, though, is how starting at about 1600 MHz, directivity starts dropping really low, less than 20 dB. What this means is that, in theory, you might not be able to accurately measure how well an antenna is resonating above 1600 MHz. So, I came up with a test case. I already own a directional coupler that covers a similar frequency band. If we take a look at the datasheet, it maintains 20 dB of directivity up to 2 GHz. Keep in mind that this isn't even that great. If you're willing to spend the money, you can get couplers that have 25 dB or better all the way up to 3 GHz. I'm going to characterize the performance of this very wideband antenna that has a 1 meter cable attached to it using both directional couplers and let's see if there are any differences. Here's the return loss chart for the Siglent bridge. All this waviness is because we have a long cable leading up to the antenna, but we're able to identify four very distinct resonant frequencies. Pay attention to how in the upper area of the spectrum, we have these significant minus 20 dB measurements caused by the long cable. With the mini circuits coupler, the 1.64 GHz peak is much more significant, and we uncover a completely hidden resonant frequency occurring at 1.81 GHz, which is exactly what we should be getting according to the datasheet. Basically, low directivity limits your ability to measure return losses beyond a certain level. So while the Siglent bridge is capable of doing measurements up to 2 GHz, I personally wouldn't have much faith in them above 1.6 GHz. At $130, this is definitely a case of you get what you pay for. So all things considered, what's the final verdict? Very good, but not perfect. Other than the control knob issues, I feel like the underlying hardware of the unit is solid and performs well. My complaints with it basically boil down to a series of minor annoyances with the firmware. I feel like it's a good mid-range spectrum analyzer for use in universities and startup companies. And amateur radio enthusiasts would absolutely love it. 
The tracking generator is easy to set up and use, and it's very affordable. If you want to measure the performance of antennas, I'm happy to recommend the reflection measurement software upgrade, but honestly, I'm not impressed with the reflection bridge hardware. I think it would be okay for amateur radio enthusiasts working on lower frequencies, but people doing serious RF work would be better off spending the extra money to get a directional coupler that maintains high directivity across a full 3 GHz span. I wish I had time to do more tests with the EMI and advanced measurement upgrades, but what I was able to test seemed good, and it's really nice to be able to get waterfall diagrams on a benchtop instrument at this price point. Thank you for watching, and I apologize if this video was more technical than usual. If you want to know more about the SSA 3000X series, check out Siglent's YouTube channel. They have a bunch of spectrum analyzer tutorials that you might find interesting.